Book the Fifth, The Descent. Chapter One, The History of a Progress in Black Glass Trinkets. And in the meantime, what had become of that mother who was, according to the people at Montfermeil, seemed to have abandoned her child? Where was she? What was she doing? After leaving her little Cosette with the Thénardiers, she had continued her journey and had reached Montreuil-sur-Mer. This, it will be remembered, was in 1818. Fantine had quitted her province ten years before Montreuil-sur-Mer had changed its aspect. While Fantine had been slowly descending from wretchedness to wretchedness, her native town had prospered. About two years previously, one of those industrial facts which are the grand events of small districts had taken place. This detail is important, and we regard it as useful to develop it at length, we should almost say, to underline it. From time immemorial, Montreuil sur mer had, for its special industry, the imitation of English jet and the black glass trinkets of Germany. This industry had always vegetated, on account of the high price of the raw material, which had reacted on the manufacture. At the moment when Fontaine retreat, returned to Montreuil sur mer an unheard of transformation had taken place in the production of black goods. Towards the close of 1815, a man, a stranger, had established himself in the town, and had been inspired with the idea of sub substituting in this manufacturer gum lac for resin, and for bracelets in particular, slides of sheet iron simply laid together for slides of soldered sheet iron. This very small change had effected a revolution. This very small change had, in fact, prodigiously reduced the cost of the raw material, which had rendered it possible in the first place to raise the price of manufacture, a benefit to the country, in the second place to improve the workmanship, an advantage to the consumer, in the third place to sell at a lower pl price while trebling the profit, which was a benefit to the manufacturer. Thus three results ensued from one idea. In less than three years, the inventor of this process had become rich, which is good, and had made everyone about him rich, which is better. He was a stranger in the department. Of his origin, nothing was known. Of the beginning of his career, very little. It was rumored that he had come to town with a very little money, a few hundred francs at the most. It was from this slender capital, enlisted in the service of an ingenious idea, developed by method and thought, that he had drawn his own fortune, and the fortune of the whole countryside. On his arrival at Montreuil-sur-Mer, he had only the garments, the appearance, and the language of a working man. It appears that on the very day when he made his obscure entry into the little town of Montreuil-sur-Mer, just at nightfall on a December evening, knapsack on back and thorn club in hand, a large fire had broken out in the town hall. This man had rushed into the flames and saved, at the risk of his own life, two children who belonged to the captain of the gendarmerie. This is why they had forgotten to ask him for his passport. Afterwards, they had learned his name. He was called Father Madeleine. Chapter 2. Madeleine. He was the man about fifty years of age, who had a preoccupied air, and who was good. That was all that could be said about him. Thanks to the rapid progress of the industry which he had so admirably reconstructed, Montreuil sur mer had become a rather important centre of trade. Spain, which consumes a good deal of black jet, made enormous purchases there each year. Montreuil sur mer almost rivaled London and Berlin in this branch of commerce. Father Madeleine's profits were such that at the end of the second year he was able to erect a large factory in which there were two vast workrooms, one for the men, the other for women. Anyone who was hungry could present himself there and was sure of finding employment and bread. Father Madeleine required the men good required of the men good will, of the women pure morals, and of all probity. He had separated the workrooms in order to separate the sexes, and so that the women and girls might remain discreet. On this point he was inflexible. It was the only thing in which he was, in a manner, intolerant. He was all the more firmly set on this severity, since Montreuil sur mer being a garrison town, opportunities for corruption abounded. However, his coming had been a boon, and his presence was a godsend. Before Ma Father Madeleine's arrival, everything had languished in the country. Now everything lived with a healthy life of toil. A strong circulation warmed everything and penetrated everywhere. Slack seasons and wretchedness were unknown. There was no pocket so obscure that it had not a little money in it, no dwelling so lowly that there was not some little joy within it. Father Madeleine gave employment to everyone. He exacted but one thing. 
be an honest man, be an honest woman. As we have said, in the midst of this activity of which he was the cause and the pivot, Father Madeleine made his fortune. But a singular thing in a simple man of business, it did not seem as though that were his chief care. He seemed to be thinking much of others and little of himself. In 1820 he was known to have a sum of 630,000 francs lodged in his name with Lafitte, but before reserving these 630,000 francs, he had spent more than a million for the town and its poor. The hospital was badly endowed. He founded six beds there. Montreux sur mer is divided into the upper and the lower town. The lower town in which he lived had but one school, a miserable hovel, which was falling to ruin. He constructed two, one for girls, the other for boys. He allotted a salary from his own funds to the two instructors, a salary twice as large as their meagre official salary. And one day he said to someone who expressed surprise, the two prime functionaries of the state are the nurse and the schoolmaster. He created at his own expense an infant school, a thing then almost unknown in France, and a fund for aiding old and infirm workmen. As his factory was a center, a new quarter, in which there were a good many indigent families, rose rapidly around him. He established there a free dispensary. At first, when they watched his beginnings, the good soul said, He is a jolly fellow who means to get rich. When they saw him enriching the country before he enriched himself, the good soul said, He is an ambitious man. This seemed all the more probable, since the man was religious, and even practiced his religion to a certain degree, a thing which was va very favorably viewed at that epoch. He went regularly to low mass every Sunday. The local deputy, who nosed out all rivalry everywhere, soon began to grow uneasy over this religion. This deputy had been a member of the legislative body of the empire, and shared the religious ideas of the father of the oratoire, known under the name of Fouché, Duc d'Otrante, whose creature and friend he had been. He indulged in a gentle raillery at God with closed doors. But when he beheld the wealthy manufacturer in Madeleine going to low mass at seven o'clock, he perceived in him a possible candidate, and resolved to outdo him. He took a Jesuit confessor and went to high mass and to vespers. Ambition was, at that time, in the direct acceptation of the word, a race to the steeple. The poor profited by this terror as well as the good of God, for the honorable deputy also founded two beds in the hospital which made twelve. Nevertheless, in 1819, a rumor one morning circulated through the town to the effect that, on the rep representations of the prefect and in consideration of the services rendered to him by the count country, Father Madeleine was to be appointed by the king, mayor of montreuil sur mer Those who had pronounced this newcomer to be an ambitious fellow seized with delight on this opportunity, which all men desire, to exclaim, There! What did we say? All Montreuil sur mer was in an uproar. The rumor was well founded. Several days later, the appointment appeared in the Moniteur. On the following day, Father Madeleine refused. In this same year of 1819, the products of the new progress process invented by Madeleine figured in the industrial exhibition. When the jury made their report, the king appointed the inventor a chevalier of the Legion of Honor. A fresh excitement in the little town. Well, so it was the cross that he wanted. Father Madeleine refused the cross. Decidedly, this man was an enigma. The good souls got out of their predicament by saying, after all, he is some sort of adventurer. We have seen that the country owed much to him. The poor owed him everything. He was so useful and he was so gentle that people had been obliged to honor and respect him. His workmen, in particular, adored him, and he endured, and he endured this adoration with a sort of melancholy gravity. When he was known to be rich, people in society bowed to him, and he received invitations in the town. He was called in town Monsieur Madeleine. His workmen and the children continued to call him Father Madeleine, and that was what was most adapted to make him smile. In proportion as he mounted, throve, invitations raised, rained down upon him. Society claimed him for its own. The prim little drawing rooms on Montreuil sur mer which, of course, had first been closed to the artisan, opened both leaves of their folding doors to the millionaire. They made a thousand advances to him. He refused. This time the good gossips had no trouble. He is an ignorant man of no education. No one knows where he came from. He would not know how to behave in society. It has not been absolutely proved that he knows how to read. When they saw him making money, they said, he is a man of business. When they saw him scattering his money about, they said, he is an ambitious man. 
when they when he was seen to decline honors they said he is an adventurer when they saw him repulse society they said he is a brute in 1820 five years after his arrival in montreuil sur mer the services which he had rendered to the district were so dazzling the opinion of the whole country round about was so unanimous that the king again appointed him mayor of the town he again declined but the prefect resisted his refusal all the notabilities of the place came to implore him the people in the street besought him the urging was so vigorous that he ended by accepting it was noticed that the thing which seemed chiefly to bring him to a decision was the almost irritated apostrophe addressed to him by an old woman of the people who called to him from her threshold in an angry way a good mayor is a useful thing is he drawing back before the good which he can do this was the third phase of his ascent father madeleine had become monsieur madeleine monsieur madeleine became monsieur le maire Chapter 3. Sums Deposited with Lafitte. On the other hand, he remained as simple as on the first day. He had grey hair, a serious eye, the sunburned complexion of a labourer, the, the thoughtful visage of a philosopher. He habitually wore a hat with a wide brim and a long coat of coarse cloth, buttoned to the chin. He fulfilled his duties as mayor, but with that exception he lived in solitude. He spoke to but few people. He avoided polite attentions. He escaped quickly. He smiled to relieve himself of the necessity of talking. He gave in order to get rid of the necessity for smiling. The women said of him, what a good-natured bear. His pleasure consisted in strolling in the fields. He always took his meals alone, with an open book before him, which he read. He had a well-selected little library. He loved books. Books are cold but safe, friends. In proportion as leisure came to him with fortune, he seemed to take advantage of it to cultivate his mind. It had been observed that, ever since his arrival at montreuil sur mer his language had grown more polished, more choice, and more gentle with every passing year. He liked to carry a gun with him on strolls, but he rarely made use of it. When he did happen to do so, his shooting was something so infallible as to inspire terror. He never killed an inoffensive animal. He never shot at a little bird. Although he was no longer young, it was thought that he was still prodigiously strong. He offered his assistance to anyone who was in need of it, lifted a horse, released a wheel clogged in the mud, or stopped a runaway bull by the horns. He always had his pockets full of money when he went out, but they were empty on his return. When he passed through a village, the ragged brats joyously ran after him and surrounded him like a swarm of gnats. It was thought that he must in the past have live a, lived a country life, since he knew all sorts of useful secrets, which he taught to the peasants. He taught them how to destroy scurf on wheat by sprinkling it and the granary and, in, and inundating the cracks in the floor with a solution of common salt, and how to chase away weevils by hanging up orviot in the bloom everywhere, on the walls and the ceilings, among the grass and in the houses. He had recipes for exterminating from a field the light, tares, foxtails, and all parasitic growths which destroy the wheat. He defended a rabbit warren against rats simply by the odor of a guinea pig which he placed in it. One day he saw some country people busily engaged in pulling up nettles. He examined the plants, which were uprooted and already dried, and said, They are dead. Nevertheless, it would be a good thing to know how to make use of them. When the nettle is young, the leaf makes an excellent vegetable. When it is older, it has filaments and fibers like hemp and flax. Nettle cloth is as good as linen cloth. Chopped up, nettles are good for poultry. Pounded, they are good for horned cattle. The seed of the nettle mixed with fodder gives gloss to the hair of animals. The root mixed with salt produces a beautiful yellow coloring matter. Moreover, moreover, it is an excellent hay, which can be cut twice. And what is required for the nettle? A little soil, no care, no culture. Only the seed falls as it is ripe, and it is difficult to collect. That is all. With the exercise of a little care, the nettle could be made useful. It is neglected and it becomes hurtful. It is exterminated. How many men resemble the nettle? He added after a pause. Remember this, my friends. There are no such things as bad plants or bad men. There are only bad cultivators. The children loved him because he knew how to make charming little trifles of straw and coconuts. When he saw the door of a church hung in black, he entered. He sought out funerals as other men seek christenings. Widowhood and the grief of others attracted him because of his great gentleness. 
he mingled with the friends clad in mourning with families dressed in black with the priests groaning around a coffin he seemed to like to give his thoughts to the thoughts for text these funeral psalmodies filled with the vision of the other world with his eyes fixed on heaven he listened with a sort of aspiration towards all the mysteries of the infinite those sad voices which sing on the verge of the obscure abyss of death he performed a multitude of good actions concealing his agency in them as a man conceals himself because of evil actions he penetrated houses privately at night he ascended staircases furtively a poor wretch on returning to his attic would find that his door had been open sometimes even forced during his absence the poor man made a clamor over it some malefactor had been there he entered and the first thing he beheld was a piece of gold laying forgotten on some piece of furniture the malefactor who had been there was father madeleine he was affable and sad the people said there is a rich man who has not a haughty air there is a happy man who has not a contented air some people maintained that he was a mysterious person and that no one ever entered his chamber which is a regular anchorite cell furnished with winged hourglasses and enlivened by crossbones and skulls of dead men this which this was much talked of so that one of the elegant and malicious young women of montreuil sur mer came to him one day and asked monsieur le maire pray show us your chamber it is said to be a grotto he smiled and introduced them instantly into this grotto they were, they were well punished for their curiosity the room was very simply furnished in mahogany which was rather ugly like all furniture of that sort and hung with paper worth twelve sous they could see nothing remarkable about it except two candlesticks of antique pattern which stood on the chimney piece and appeared to be silver for they were hallmarked an observation full of the type of wit of petty towns nevertheless people continued to say that no one ever got into the room and that it was a hermit's cave a mysterious retreat a hole a tomb it was also whispered that he had an immense sums of deposit with lafitte with this peculiar feature that they could that they were always at his immediate disposal so that it was added monsieur madeleine could make his appearance at lafitte's any morning sign a receipt and carry off his two or three millions in ten minutes in reality these two or three millions were reducible as we have said to six hundred and thirty or forty thousand francs chapter four monsieur madeleine in mourning at the beginning of eighteen twenty the newspapers announced the death of monsieur Meriel, bishop of digne surnamed monseigneur bienvenu who had died in the odour of sanctity at the age of eighty-two the bishop of digne to supply here a detail which the papers admitted had been blind for many years before his death and content to be blind as his sister was beside him let us remark by the way that to be blind and to be loved is in fact one of the most strangely exquisite forms of happiness upon this earth where nothing is complete to have continually at one side a woman a daughter a sister a charming being who is there because you need her and because she cannot do without you to know that we are indispensable to a person who is necessary to us to be able to incessantly measure one's affection by the amount of her presence which she bestows upon us and to say to ourselves since she consecrates the whole of her time to me it is because i possess the whole of her heart to behold her thought in lieu of her face to be able to verify the fidelity of one's being amid the eclipse of the world to regard the rustle of a gown as the sound of wings to hear her come and go retire speak return sing and to think that one is the centre of these steps of this speech to manifest at each instant one personal attraction to feel oneself all the more powerful because of one's infirmity to become in one's obscurity and through one's obscurity the star around which this angel gravitates few felicities equal this the supreme happiness of life consists in the conviction that one is loved loved for one's own sake let us say rather loved in spite of oneself this conviction the blind man possesses to be served in distress is to be caressed does he lack anything no one does not lose the sight when one has love and what love a holy a love wholly consisted of virtue there is no blindness where there is certainty soul seeks soul gropingly and finds it and this soul found and tested is a woman a hand sustains you it is hers a mouth lightly touches your brows it is her mouth you hear a breath very near you it is hers 
to have everything of her, from her worship to her pity, never to be left, to have that sweet weakness aiding you, to lean upon that immovable reed, to touch providence with one's hands, and to be able to take it in one's arms, God made tangible, what bliss! The heart, that obscure celestial flower, undergoes a mysterious blossoming. One would not exchange that shadow for all brightness. The angel soul is there, uninterruptingly there. If she departs, it is to return again. She vanishes like a dream and reappears like reality. One feels warmth approaching, and behold, she is there. One overflows with serenity, with gaiety, with ecstasy. One is a radiance amid the night. And there are a thousand little cares. Nothings which are enormous in that void. The most ineffable accents of the feminine voice employed to lull you, and supplying the vanished universe to you. One is caressed with the soul. One sees nothing, but one feels that one is adored. It is a paradise of shadows. It was from this paradise that Monsieur Bonvenu had passed to the other. The announcement of his death was reprinted by the local journal of Montreuil sur mer On the following day, Monsieur Madeleine appeared clad wholly in black and with crepe on his hat. This morning was noticed in the town and commented on. It seemed to throw light on Monsieur Madeleine's origin. It was concluded that some relationship existed between him and the venerable and the venerable bishop. He has gone into mourning for the bishop of Digne, said the drawing rooms. This raised Monsieur Madeleine's credit greatly, and procured for him instantly and at one blow a certain consideration in the noble world of Montreuil sur Mer. The microscopic Faubourg Saint Germain of the place med meditated raising the quarantine against Monsieur Madeleine, the probable relative of the bishop. Monsieur Madeleine perceived the advancement which he had obtained by the more numerous courtesies of the old women and the more plentiful smiles of the young ones. One evening, a ruler in that petty great world, who was curious by right of seniority, ventured to ask him, Monsieur Le Maire is doubtless a cousin of the late Bishop of Digne? He said, No, madame. But, resumed the dowager, you are wearing mourning for him. He replied, It is because I was a servant in his family in my youth. Another thing which was remarked was that every time he encountered in the town a young Savoyard who was roaming around the country and seeking chimneys to sweep, the mayor had him summoned, inquired his name, and gave him money. The little Savoyards told each other about it. A great many of them passed that way.